seventh episode of Live a Smart Life Doctor series. Today, we have Dr. Niam Zin Ying, Pediatrician of International Baby, Child and Adolescent Clinic, Singapore, to talk about autism. Dr. Niam graduated from National University of Singapore Faculty of Medicine in 2005. She was trained at National University Hospital and obtained her Master of Medicine, Pediatrics, Singapore, in 2010. She completed her advanced specialist training in 2014. During her advanced training, she worked with the Child Development Unit at National University Hospital. She had an interest in child abuse and neglect and her previous research on this topic was supported by Singapore Children's Society. She also spent a month at Stanford University School of Medicine to gain further exposure in developmental and behavioral pediatrics. Dr. Niam has a strong interest in medical education and patient education. She strives to empower families to raise happy, resilient children both in her daily work and as a volunteer with Caring SG and Zuchi. Finally, she is a keen artist whose drawings can be found on the cover of National University Hospital's handbook, Pediatrics on the Go, and in IBCA's patient education booklets. Welcome to the seventh episode of Live a Smart Life Doctor series from Hiranya Medical Service. Today, we have with us Dr. Nyan Singh Ying, a pediatrician from International Baby, Child and Adolescent Clinic, Singapore. And my co-host is none other than my pillar of strength, my mom, Mrs. Nanda Suresh. Good morning, doctor. Nice meeting you here today. Thank you for having me, uh, Hiranya. Thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm very pleased that you're using your platform to raise awareness and educate the public on all kinds of health issues. So it's quite exciting and interesting to be here today. Thank you, doctor. So today we'll be discussing about autism spectrum disorder. And we come across many people in our life who have poorly developed social skills or difficulty with expressive and receptive communication and the presence of restrictive and repetitive behaviors. So I thought this topic would be useful to discuss about and you know create awareness. So um, let's move on to the questions, doctor. Doctor, first, can you please tell us in brief what is autism spectrum disorder? Okay, autism spectrum disorder or ASD for short refers to a broad range of conditions and basically they're characterized by challenges with social communication and interaction, restrictive or repetitive behaviors and interests. And very often, there are also difficulties with speech. And it's not just about the ability to speak, but also the way that language is used in the social context. So there's a very wide clinical spectrum. And so, you know, if you've met one child with ASD, you've met one person with ASD, you know, the clinical picture is actually very varied. So in terms of the prevalence, right, um, the worldwide prevalence is about 1 in 160 children, according to the WHO. Now, in Singapore, the figure is very slightly higher. We estimate that 1 in 150 children in Singapore are diagnosed with ASD. Um, and in the US, the latest figures seem to suggest that it's actually higher than that. Were there 1 in 54 children. Yeah, so that number actually varies from country to country. Also, I think it depends on how um, available the services are for diagnosis and intervention in the countries involved. Mm -hmm. I have some known contacts whose children have ASD. So I would like to know more information from you, doctor. Mm -hmm. Can you please tell us what causes this ASD? Is ASD inherited or all other factors, any other factors involved in this as well? Okay, so uh, I think that's a very interesting question. And the thing about uh, the thing about most of the developmental disorders, right, including ASD, is that very often there is no single cause. You know, it's not like COVID-19 is caused by the coronavirus and, you know, that's the only cause. But even then you can see that for a single virus, the clinical presentation is different. Some people have it milder and some people end up in the ICU, right? So similarly, uh, but here the causation is rather different. We think it's an interplay of genetic and environmental risk factors, right? So there's a quite a strong genetic association with ASD as, as with quite a number of other developmental disorders. We know that some genetic disorders are associated with ASD, including fragile X syndrome and tuberous sclerosis. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of these, and probably one day, Hiranya, you are going to try to study this for pediatrics anyway. 
Um, but then, you know, for a minority of cases, there may be single gene disorders. But even then, even so, um, very often a genetic cause cannot be found even if you go and test everybody. So, uh, but we do know that the risk of recurrence in siblings is actually higher than in the general population. And if you look at extended families, you may find that, you know, if you look back a couple of generations, maybe some of the family members in the extended family may actually have some traits, even if they are not formally diagnosed with ASD. So I think that's really interesting. So, um, but genetics aside, we do know also that there are other risk factors. For example, preterm birth, if a baby is born prematurely, or if they are part of multiple births, or if they are of low birth weight. So all of these are risk factors at the point of birth that actually can contribute to the risk of um, ASD later on. And finally, one of the interesting risk factors is to do with the father's age of and when baby is conceived. So um, with increasing paternal age, the, in rate, the odds of having a child with ASD also increases. Okay, that's interesting to know, you know, like this uh, a mixed role of both genetics and environmental factors for ASD. So I have a follow-up question, like in terms of the causes. Um, I know that there's a rumor in terms of MMR vaccine, like even though it's given to protect measles, mumps and rubella, um, yeah. it's like, you know, a rumor that it's causing ASD. But I think that's not true, right, doctor? Could you please tell more about that? Oh my gosh, it's not true. It's not true. Okay, so... Um, I think this problem dates back to a paper that was published a few decades ago in 1997 by Andrew Wakefield, who is this British surgeon, right? And the thing is that his paper, which was based on like 12 kids, got published in The Lancet, which is actually a very prestigious, highly ranked medical journal. And his study seems to suggest that the measles, mum rubella vaccine may cause autism in British children. But the thing is that this paper, actually, when you look back at it, there were actually quite serious errors in the paper and there were actually financial conflicts of interest and ethical violations in the process of uh, doing this study. And subsequently, the paper was completely discredited, you see. And subsequently, Andrew Wakefield also lost his medical license, so he can't practice medicine anymore. And the paper was retracted from the journal, you see. So the problem, but the, by that time, the damage is already done, you see. And lots of people actually believe that vaccines can cause autism. Now, uh, there have been follow-up studies uh, that actually followed many, many children, you know, hundreds of thousands of children in subsequent studies, and actually they did not demonstrate any link between vaccination and autism. Now, and I think even if you don't know statistics, you can think quite logically about it, right? If you were to, if vaccines cause autism, and if the vaccination rate falls because people are scared of getting their kids vaccinated, by you should see a, also a drop in um the diagnosis of ASD in the following months or years, right? That didn't happen, you see. Um, what happened was that when in some of, especially in the Western countries where some people became very vaccine phobic, they didn't vaccinate their kids. The rate of autism has not gone down. And, but yet the subsequent, the, the consequence of all of this is that children are now getting uh, measles and all these uh, vaccine preventable disease and people are dying of measles, which is, uh, you know, a complete waste is a, it's a, actually, I find this is a tragedy, you see. So I think we need to emphasize, and when you see patients next time, Hiran, yeah, you, if you meet uh, all these uh, anti-vaxxer parents like this, you do need to actually explain nicely that, you know, really the link is, that the link is not proven at all. Yeah, definitely. I do agree, doctor. Like, it's important yeah. to, you know, emphasize on this point of the anti-vaxxer, like, you know, so that's important. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, so, doctor, how does a parent identify or know that, you know, the child has this ASD? Or is there any criteria to diagnose ASD? You know, I think last time um, in university, we learned about ASD and the criteria for diagnosing that. So, I think it includes criteria such as um, deficits in social and communication skills, um, restricted and repetitive or sensory behaviors and interests as well. So, um, doctor, could you please elaborate more on these criteria? Okay, so, uh, Hiranya, actually, you are quite right that these are the two broad areas of difficulty that uh, most, AS, most individuals with ASD have. So, um, like I said, um, there is, it is a clinical diagnosis, okay? ASD is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, there is no lab test or 
you know, scan that will diagnose it for sure. The, not the way that, you know, you do a swap, a PCR swap and you can identify COVID-19. Yeah, so it's not like, unfortunately, again, it's not so straightforward in terms of causation and diagnosis. But you're right that, broadly speaking, uh, the two areas of difficulty are in social interaction and communication and in restrictive repetitive behaviours and interests. Now, uh, for the social interaction and communication, it, it refers to dif difficulties in areas like social emotional reciprocity. Yeah? Okay, so that means like difficulties in back and forth communication. Like, you know, even if the child is actually quite verbal, they might not be able to carry out a to and from conversation, or they may not really respond to others' attempts to interact with them or initiate that conversation. Okay, um, we're also looking at nonverbal communicative behaviors like you know eye contact or gestures uh, that are used appropriately and then um, also developing and maintaining relationships like you know making friends or um, having an interest in peers or being able to adjust your behavior to suit the social context you know like you know you conduct yourself in a certain way you sit in a certain way when you are with uh, your friends versus like somebody who in a more formal setting and some people may not be able to adjust to that so the other part of it, like we said, was restricted repetitive behaviours and interests. So I think classically, people think of these stereotype motor movements, like the child who spins around or flaps their hands or lines up the toys in a row or kind of like, you know, has repetitive speech, like they tend to repeat what others said or what they heard on TV repeatedly. Okay, um, but there's a little more to it. So um, the other areas of where this can be where this can hinder their life is say insistence on this sameness, you know, about their routines. And so some, some children may actually become quite distressed if there's a deviation from the routine. So like, um, you know, I think all of us get a little thrown off balance if we don't have our usual routine. Maybe we don't have our cup of tea or something like that, but it doesn't, for the most part, it doesn't distress us too much. But for some of these individuals, it can be very upsetting and they can actually may not be able to function very well if they don't have their follow their usual uh, rituals or routines. And this also comes from the fact that they might have rather rigid thinking patterns. Yeah. So then there's also something about, you know, the unusual intensity of focus with interest, right? So sometimes, you know, uh, you may find children who have a very strong preoccupation with certain objects like spinning, spinning objects, or certain toys and you know their play is kind of like restricted around those few types of toys uh, and you know it's quite persistent and finally one thing that is not really that was wasn't in past diagnostic criteria but now sensory issues are actually recognized as part of the DSM-5 criteria if you look at some of the formal diagnostic criteria for ASD right uh, so sensory issues are actually a big thing in uh, children with ASD and adults too yeah so they can for example have a extreme aversion to certain sounds or certain tastes or certain textures or, you know, unusual interest in it. So you keep touching and touching or mouthing things. And, you know, of course, this then also creates, this also leads on to other issues, which I'll talk about later, like, you know, things like feeding or uh, um, kind of like the risk of accidents or injury and things like that, of course. So at the end of the day, right, um, these behaviours actually need to be present in childhood. They need to be present quite early in childhood. Although the caveat is that there are people who are diagnosed only adulthood. You know? And the diagnosis may not be that obvious until much later in life when the social demands exceed this, person's, this particular person's capacity to deal with them. So some children are very good at masking their symptoms and they might actually, you know, um, kind of like try to imitate what their peers are doing or what their family members are doing and so kind of like get away to some extent with it if they're otherwise some of them you know a little bit odd but they're doing well in school so people don't really uh, worry too much until they actually present with real difficulties like feeding difficulties or mental health conditions and stuff like that and the uh, as we said the, diff the behavior should cause significant difficulty with their day-to-day -day functioning in the social educational occupational areas you see so like i said just now you know you might be thrown off balance a little bit but if you can still get on with your day and go to school and all that that's not so bad but if it really throws you off so much that you really can't function that's a that's uh then you know it does cause significant impairment and finally it should not be better explained by other diagnoses like intellectual disability but having said that 
a proportion of people with autism are also have also got intellectual disability. So we want to see whether the, you know, the difficulty in social skills is actually out of proportion to that is expected of their general developmental age. Right. So uh, like we said earlier, it can be associated with known medical or genetic conditions or in occur together with other be behavioral or developmental disorders. And it may or may not be associated with language impairment. So I think one thing is that a lot of people think that all children with uh, autism are actually uh, verbally or language impaired. And that is not really true. I think the difference is the way, even for a person who's highly verbal, the way that they think about language or the way they use it in daily life. Yeah. Uh, well, Dr. Your answer was very, very you know, detailed and very informative. We got a lot of info from this. Uh, by the way, uh, doctor, I have a friend in Singapore. She has a child who will not respond to anything. Like even if we call her name repeatedly, she does not respond at all. So is this how a child with ASD behaves? Uh -huh. So I think for this particular child's case, for me, the main thing is I want to find out whether the child is actually able to respond to other sounds, you know, and whether she had any of the other behaviors that we described above, you see. And for me, this child, I would certainly refer her for hearing tests because for children who don't respond to calling or who have delayed speech, we do need to exclude hearing impairment as a cause before we conclude that all of the behavior we see is due to autism spectrum disorder, right? So I think if you go to any of the public hospitals, if, if your child had gone to any of the public hospitals in Singapore, um, you will find that one of the first things that they do after uh, making the pro after actually seeing the child, maybe to arrange for the child to receive a hearing evaluation to make sure that, you know, if there's a speech delay, we want to make sure that it's not due to hearing impairment that then needs to be addressed by another way, uh, treated another way, you see. But assuming that this particular child has ASD, then actually there's a biological basis to many of the behaviors that we see. I think we, you know, when we think about children with developmental di difficulties who have certain behaviors, I think we need to remember that the behavior is really the tip of the iceberg. So, you know, what we see, right, is on the surface is actually just the tip of the iceberg and about six, seven of the iceberg is all the way below the water, right? So we need to think about, you know, what is actually that basis, right? So for example, right, for children who don't respond to their name, maybe it's because they have difficulty filtering out environmental sounds or that they, can't really, they don't really differentiate well between the sounds of the name or other sounds or that it's just that the brain doesn't respond, just this response differently to their name compared to uh, neurotypical, so-called neurotypical people. Yeah, and uh, also the other thing about uh, eye contact, you know, which is like a classic sign, right? It's not that they, have a lack of concern about other people, like they don't care about others, you know, but it can be actually truly stressful and uncomfortable for them to make eye contact because of the way their brain responds to direct eye contact. And of course, things like social interaction, uh, the difficulties with social uh, situations may be because they have a lack of awareness of how they feel themselves, you see, like they may not be able to be very in touch with their own emotions or how they feel or even things like whether I'm hungry or thirsty or tired. And so that they can go into a, they, some people actually go into a meltdown and it's very hard for them to express why they can't tell you, oh, I'm so hungry, I want to eat something. Yeah. And sometimes they have difficulty reading other people's non-verbal cues like other people's facial expressions or their body language and a lack of awareness of what, whether, you know, what they said was inappropriate or offensive can also lead to other social difficulties. So really that is the, I mean, that is what we see, what actually goes on below the iceberg for some people. Okay. Yes, doctor. So based on these clinical diagnoses, like, you know, the criteria mentioned, you said, um, I'm sorry, I'll really repeat the question. Yeah. So um, what are some of the clinical tests that are done to diagnose ASD, doctor? Sorry? What are some of the clinical tests done to diagnose ASD, doctor? Uh, okay, so the clinical tests, right? Um, like I said, it's a clinical diagnosis. So um, there are no tests, like lab tests or scans that definitively diagnose it. But then um, there is a role for certain types of 
testing like genetic testing or MRI brain, if we see certain, and this is all guided by the history and examination of the patient. So for example, I, I would be more likely to scan, order a scan for the brain. If for example, the child's head appears very large or very small for their age, you know, or if the child has certain facial features that suggest that hey, maybe there's an underlying syndrome, we might look, we might do some uh, genetic or chromosomal testing to look for certain syndromes. Yeah. Okay. In terms of the actual diagnosis of ASD, we use screening tools. Like sometimes we just give out some parent questionnaires, you know, they just take off yes, no, yes, no, you know, whether your child has this, your child has that. So um, those are like the MCHAT R questionnaire, which is used for the younger children, like 16 to 30 months old, and the CAST questionnaire, which will be used for older kids, four years old and above. So in general, these are like just screening tools. They do not make a definitive diagnosis, but if a child has a certain cutoff point and above, right, then we might actually look more carefully into, the, into pursuing a diagnosis. And as for diagnostic tools that help us kind of like confirm a diagnosis, um, there are tools like the autism diagnostic interview, which is really a very long <laughs> parent interview. Uh, and the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, second edition, the ADOS tool, which is actually a sort of semi-structured observation of the child in a variety of tasks. Like we might watch a child, how they react with free play when given certain toys and also certain tasks that are initiated by the examiner. So in doing some of these tasks, we look for some of the, we look and see whether the child has certain behaviors or not. And then we score that. Yeah, so that's how the, and you know, all of this, of course, also depends on whether the child is reported to have similar behaviors in across different settings. Because we, of course, if a child is making eye contact in all in all situations except maybe in front of certain people, then of course that's not ASD. You see, so the the clinical history has to be very carefully taken as the start of as the foundation of everything. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got it. Uh, well, uh, doctor, I believe some people with ASD, these people, they even have anxiety, depression, sleep disorder, etc. And can you please throw some light on the medical issues associated with this office? Yeah, I certainly can. I'm going to do that very briefly because, you know, that can be a talk on itself, right? Okay, but... Um, I'll talk about ASD and physical health and also its relationship to mental health. Okay, so we'll start with physical health, right? So um, children with ASD, people with ASD are actually also, there's a higher uh, prevalence of epilepsy. That means like seizure disorders in this population and also of tic disorders like Tourette's syndrome. So tics are actually like involuntary twitches or like, you know, like some vocalizations or some like quick motor, uh, kind of like movements like, you know, shrugging shoulders or moving the head or something like that. So it's different from seizures, but that can also be quite disturbing for the person. Uh, you know, just now we talked about sensory issues, right? And so some of them get the gastrointestinal disorder. So, you know, just like you and me, they get constipation and gastritis and all these, but they might have a harder time expressing the discomfort or pain. So sometimes the diagnosis may be, may, they may take a longer time to get diagnosed because it's hard to actually for them to express what exactly is bothering them. And also feeding challenges are quite significant. So um, I attended a conference where they spoke about uh, eating disorders in uh, patients with ASD. So they find that they actually describe that some of these young, some young women who are thought to have anorexia nervosa is not really the classic anorexia nervosa where people are concerned about their weight or their figure. It's actually these are harder, in a sense, harder to treat, deem as harder to treat because um, their problem is not really that of image, their body image or their weight. Their concern is more, their concerns are different, you see, like they might have a harder time, they might have a harder time accepting certain foods. You know, they might have aversions to certain textures of food or taste of food. Uh, they might have a hard time adjusting if, like, you, you know, some foods, foods that where it's the same food, but even the packaging changes, some people have a really hard time adjusting to that, so they can't eat anymore. Um, and sometimes it's also that they get very overwhelmed if they have to eat in social situations, like the school canteen or at social events. Yeah, so all these are actually quite significant challenges that, you know, it's not on the diagnostic criteria, but it can actually lead to all these things that affect 
the life of the person very much. Um, certainly, there are also sleep difficulties, like difficulty getting to sleep, or, and parents may experience difficulty sleep training their children. And finally, accidents and injury are always a concern because uh, some uh, children with ASD have a lack of sense of danger, so they might you know, have a hard time following instructions or understanding why uh, you don't allow them to do certain things. Sometimes because of the sensory issues, they might end up mouthing or eating certain non-food items that can lead to poisoning. And uh, yeah, it's all sense it can be because of sensory seeking behavior. Okay, so that's physical health. And then the mental health piece is also that ASD co can coexist with conditions like um, ADHD, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Actually, there's a lot of overlap in the two conditions in that children can appear hyperactive or don't take instructions well or have social difficulties when they, you know, they don't realize they actually offended somebody because of their actions or words that they didn't really think about, right? Yeah, and also... Um, it can many people with ASD have anxiety disorders because you know basically coping in a neuro a person who is differently wired coping in a neurotypical world can actually be very stressful, right? And changes in their routine or the environment can be quite anxiety inducing. So the interesting thing, like when I, that I alluded to just now, was that some higher functioning uh, people might try to camouflage their might try to camouflage their difficulties by mimicking certain social behaviors, even when they don't quite understand why they're done that way. But then over the long term, as the social demands actually increase, like you know, they get more complex in adolescence and young adulthood, then that's when uh, things start to all this anxiety disorders start to show up. And I also spoke a little bit about eating disorders just now. So um yeah, that's also can lead of course to a medical disorder. Um depression uh can be a presenting symptom can actually be a presenting problem in some of the young adults or adolescents, you know, uh, because they might they might have been so good at hiding or if their symptoms are actually not that obvious to the eye until they actually it the demands exceed their capacities. Yeah, and you know, I think we need to remember that many children adolescents with autism are also the victims of bullying and teasing. And you know, I think we Need, and I think we need to talk a little bit about later on about how we can support these children in the school setting and all that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and by the way, how do you manage the co-occurring medical or this developmental conditions? Yeah, so how we manage the co-occurring medical and mental health conditions, right? So first of all, I think I'll talk about the medical part first because that's a little more straightforward. Um, so, of course, I think you need to see what the syndrome, if there's an underlying syndrome, of course, then um, the relevant specialists need to actually follow up this child and do surveillance for complications of other organs. So, for example, we know that certain uh, syndromes are associated with a uh, thyroid problem. You might want to screen the thyroid, do a thyroid function test. If you want to, if you know that it's associated with kidney tumors or something, you might want to do an ultrasound of the kidney at certain intervals. Uh, you need to treat the coexisting medical conditions just like you would for anybody else, like, you know, give anti-epileptic medicines for epilepsy. And the family and medical team actually need to work together quite tightly to manage acute illnesses and well-child visits because, you know, the overwhelm from being sick and then having to go to stay in hospital, for example, when you're acutely unwell can be quite overwhelming for the child and also and subsequently the family. Yeah, and well-child visits, like, you know, you need to think about some children, we, we know that some of our patients are coming because we can hear them screaming from outside the clinic. Yeah, they know, they, the moment they see the clinic in the door, they know what they're here for, like their vaccinations or whatever. And so we need to manage that quite carefully. Yeah, and then um, for the so-called uh, developmental and mental health issues, uh, some co-occurring ones can be, so can be managed with medications, right? like uh, ADHD, there is proven benefit of stimulant medications for these. And then um, for anxiety and depression, yes, those can be medicated. And for all of these also, there is therapy available, right? One of the things that I want to emphasize a little bit is that uh, for children on the autism spectrum, we need to monitor their growth and nutritional status. Yeah, so it's not that we only think, take care of the ASD, but we also need to remember that because of their sensory aversion, so texture and taste and things about like that about food, 
and that some have very limited preferences for food. So that's why there is a risk of malnutrition. And um, some of them may be placed on restrictive diets by parents who are trying to cure autism. More about that later, but yeah, that can also be a risk factor for um, nutritional difficulties. And I think, you know, we never, in pediatrics, you never see the child alone. We need to think about the child as part of the family unit and part of society. So the mental and physical health of the child's caregivers also need to be monitored. And, you know, we need to be quite sharp and look out for these if a caregiver is struggling and refer them on to necessary services. Okay. Yes, doctor. I think um, that's very interesting. And also you mentioned the therapy, right? So I have like a follow-up question on that. Um, this is related to ASD itself, um, not just about the associated conditions, but yeah. Um, I think uh, it was two or three years ago when I finished my music class and I came out, I saw a girl with similar behaviors and uh, she also learns music. And when I asked my teacher, he told me that many students with ASD have unique talents such as singing. So could music therapy also be a form of alternative treatment for people with ASD? Okay, yeah, I think that's a good question. So I think for this girl who's attending the same class, who's attending a class with your teacher as well, it may not be so much from the therapeutic point of view. I think we need to remember that many autistic people are actually also gifted and talented in specific areas, you know. So they might be thought of as twice exceptional, you know, like being gifted and talented in one area while also having a concurrent medical, uh, mental or developmental uh, difficulty. Yeah, so I think for these individuals, it's true that engaging in music and art, things that they're good at is, has therapeutic value, but it's also talent development just as for neurotypical children. You know, I think at this point, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the usual kinds of um, management. And then also I'm going to talk a little bit about complementary alternative treatments here. So just very briefly, right, for um, intervention for the typical kind of interventions that we have for children with ASD uh, will take the form of early intervention programs and school support. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, there are adult services, which are not very well developed, but they're coming up. So for children who are receiving early intervention, usually once we identify that a child's at risk of autism or looks like, you know, the clinical diagnosis is that even before we, they get on to the more detailed psychological testing and all that, we can actually initiate um, a referral to early intervention services. Yeah, so some of these are funded by our government in Singapore sitting and some are in the private sector. And essentially, right, um, it's actually... Uh, giving small group or one-to-one -one, uh, teaching, uh, specialized teaching with inputs very often from speech therapists, or occupational therapists, and specialized teachers. And uh, it's based on individual education plan, based on the child's uh, strengths and difficulties at that point when they enter the system. Uh, and then, you know, these goals are actually, there are certain goals are set out, and these goals are revised as time goes on and the child progresses. Yeah, so... Um, there are many different philosophies of how of the methods that are used to treat uh, children with autism. I don't think I'm going to go too much into that right now because we also need to think about beyond the early years, right, of early intervention, what happens next in, like, in primary and secondary school. So many of our kids actually attend mainstream schools with school-based support. And, you know, Students may receive accommodations for school and national exams based on professional opinion, like by the psychologist when they do a IQ testing and all that. And some attend autism specialized schools as well as other special schools. So in Singapore, we have two um, schools called Path Flight School and St. Andrew's Mission School, which is going to start next year. And they offer the mainstream curriculum for children with uh, intellectual and language abilities in the normal range. Uh, but with a diagnosis of ASD, right? And other, the other schools are catered to children who have associated intellectual disability. And then moving on, very often vocational training and talent development is done in the senior school years to prepare all these children for the workplace and higher education. Yeah, so that is actually the overview of what typically is done. Okay, but we also recognize that a lot of our patients actually go for so-called uh, complementary alternative treatments. So like just now you were saying, um, Music whether music and art therapy is uh, a common thing. Yes, it is fairly common and um, it can be 
definitely of value for children who have that inclination towards art and music because it's quite safe and I mean even in a child who's not very verbal in the act of music therapy like you know beating the drums or things like that it, you can practice skills like turn taking and watching the other person's reactions right okay and but we also need to caution about therapies that are not effective you see and in fact can be unsafe so just now I alluded to children who parents try to put them on very restrictive diets uh, to try to cure their autism, right? And the thing is that by and large, these are not, uh, these are not evidence-based uh, in a sense. So some people might try to take out gluten or casein, which is like milk from the diet. And in children who are already picky eaters, I worry a little bit about this causing uh, worsening nutrition deficiency, you see. And then there are more dangerous things like chelation therapy, like trying to put an IV infusion to try to so-called flush out toxins that cause ASD. Uh, it's quite, it was quite popular in some circles in the US, but actually can cause more harm than good, of course. And then mega doses of vitamins or other supplements where there's actually real, no real evidence of benefit. And of course, there are risks associated with vitamin toxicity. So I would say all these... Um, where you know you actually have to put something in where you're actually injecting something in the body, especially, I think I would really proceed with caution. I would not recommend them. Okay. Yes, doctor. I actually wanted to ask you about the prognosis and how we can um, you know intervene earlier in order to prevent worsening prognosis of ASC and also how to support children with ASC in school. So can you elaborate more on the early intervention? Okay, so I spoke about that very, only very briefly. Doctor, we can't hear you at all. Okay, I spoke about that only very briefly earlier. Yeah, so I think I'll dive a little deeper into some of the names that, uh, some of the methods that parents may actually read about when they're actually researching about uh, early intervention for their children. So um, briefly, I think there are many different philosophies, but I'm going to just very briefly talk about um, three main ones that we that are in common use. The first one is Applied Behavior Analysis or ABA. Now, this one is the most studied and it's been around the longest. And for a long time, this was considered the gold standard of treatment, right? And it, it's a very highly structured approach to teach communication and uh, daily living skills to children on the spectrum. Now, and it uses a lot of repetition and positive reinforcement to encourage desired behavior. Now, if you look historically, actually the roots of ABA are actually in animal training. And so there was a, in, in, in its earliest form, ABA had both positive reinforcement, which is like praise and negative reinforcement, which is like punishment to eliminate undesired behaviors. But of course, nowadays we don't actually do the negative stuff anymore. Okay. But in recent years, there has been a little bit of controversy about ABA because now that now the autistic people themselves who went through ABA are now adults and very verbal and communicative, they actually describe feeling a bit disrespected by all this like, you know, repetition and trying to eliminate their so-called undesired behaviors when part of it is really what they are and they actually and it didn't really address the root. Sometimes, depending on the therapist, it may not have addressed the root of why they conduct these behaviors in the first place. Okay, but ABA, I think it still has its place because it's a very strong, it's got a very structured uh, teaching style and it has been around the longest. Okay, the second is something called P-E-A-C-C-H, like teach, right? Um, so that's the short form for treatment and education of autistic and related communication handicapped children. I would say that this is one of the most widely employed uh, methods in our local uh, early intervention centers. Okay, and it's actually, it, it, how it does, what it does is that it actually sets up a structured classroom environment based on the unique learning needs of people with ASD. So many autistic people are actually very highly visual learners. So it relies on things like visual schedules and charts and areas of, you know, defined activity spaces like in the classroom, you know, different sections are designated for different activities. And um, so there's actually quite strong evidence for educational benefits for this particular method. And then finally, there's something called DIR floor time. So DIR stands for Developmental Individual Differences and Relationship-Based Model. And for this one, it's not so much of repetitive um, or drilling of the child, but more of um, the caregiver-child relationship being at the center of the model. So 
in playing, in kind of like engaging the child, you know, or playing together, the caregiver becomes responsive to the child's cues. And so they might actually join in with the child in what they're doing, or they might imitate what the child is doing, even if they're doing something, you know, like taking and putting in and taking out stuff from a box or banging the toys together, something simple like that, you know. And then from there, they build upon that to impart communication and social skills. So those are three of them, some of them because um, and most commonly uh, cited kind of uh, methods in early intervention programs, right? So doctor, what is your opinion on increasing awareness of ASD? Okay, so I mean, I think that um, already there is increasing societal awareness about ASD and other developmental disorders, right? So it is happening already, although we have a long way to go. So um, for example, we realize now that families and teachers and healthcare professionals are actually more aware. And very often the preschool teachers are the ones actually pushing the parents to go and seek medical attention for their child. Because they say, hey, you know, your child is not having, is not interacting with the other children or, um, or having eye contact when we talk to him, you know. So actually it tells me that teachers are actually receiving some training already. And even primary school teachers might call the parents out and say, hey, I think your, your kid has, do you think your child needs an evaluation or something, you know, because there's so much awareness now, okay? Um, but I think there is still a social stigma, which, you know, I think we need to look, we need to dive a little deeper into. Um, the awareness of ASD is really that, you know, is teachers, healthcare professionals, families getting more aware. And I think we also need to recognize that actually there is, that the, you know, this seeming increasing prevalence of ASD, right? I think people are also becoming a little more aware that it is not, it's not only because, you know, people think that there must be something in the water or something in the environment that's causing it. So that is, is partly because of a broadening uh, diagnostic criteria over the decades, right? Because when autism was first described, the description was a very narrow description, but now it has broadened to include children who are much higher functioning as well. And, um, there's also, I think there is a true increase, but that might be due to more children surviving premature birth and more children being born to older parents, particularly older fathers. Yeah, so I think overall there is increasing prevalence, but there's also increasing awareness of autism, really. Well, see, as I told you before, my friend who has a child with similar problems, she doesn't even bring her child for any birthday parties or any get-together functions, you know. Yes, Doctor, I was also wondering about this. So what would be the challenges faced by the parents of autistic children? They will not be able to attend any social functions because, you know, they need to face the behavioral pattern of the child in a common forum. So they might be refraining from attending social get-togethers. And of course, yeah, they do have the responsibility to groom their child. So um, I'm sure you will be going through a lot of cases like this on a day-to-day -day basis. And how do you manage? Um, I'm sorry. I'm sure you'll be going through a lot of cases like this on a day-to-day -day basis. So how do they manage? And how can we as a society or community extend our help to all these people suffering from autism? Can you please, you know, give your suggestions on this, doctor? Okay, so, you know, I think uh, the first thing is that if, you know, earlier when we first started, we said if you've seen one person or if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person, you've seen one person with autism. And it's a very different picture for everybody. So, you know, the challenges, of course, are also to different extents. But I get what you mean that um, there is a certain social stigma to autism. I think that a lot of people feel that there's a social stigma to having a a differently uh, wired child, you know, a child with autism. And it is also true that because of the child's patterns of behavior, you know, like, you know, sensory overwhelm from noise or lots of different or lots of in crowded places, they may not be able to conduct themselves well. So there is, yes, there is a certain amount of fear of entering a social function. And I think from our part, from the professional point of view, we do want to actually make sure that we pick, these, pick up these difficulties and we see whether there's something we can do to help the parents uh, prepare the child for such, uh, for such functions and as well as um, sort of like 
shift their own mindset around uh, autism, you see. Yeah, because um, I would say that, you know, um, children with autism, right, are actually doing better than in the past. Now, we have to recognize that for the vast majority of these children, autism is a lifelong condition, right? But then, like we say, social mindsets are actually changing and people are actually becoming more aware and also becoming more inclusive and accepting of this idea of neurodiversity that not everybody is wired in the same way. And because um, of these changes in mindset, services have become more available and children are also doing better than in the past. Yeah, so I think that, you know, these, diffic- these social difficulties can actually, to some extent, be overcome. They might not be able to deal with it the same way that they would tell their neurotypical children, ah, you know, just behave, just do this as I tell you and, you know, um, everything will be fine. But for these children, you need to take into consideration what are the difficulties they have, right? You know, is it that they don't have the words to greet pe- They don't know how to greet people or is it that there's a lot of sensory issues like when they go to a big crowded place, with lots of lights or lots of sounds and that actually is difficult in which case are there ways of getting around it you know like maybe letting, saying that you know the child just needs to be there for a short while and after that you could ask your host for example is there a quiet corner where my kid can go to chill up to kind of like cool down after if it gets too much for them you know so that for this kind of situation I think is that we don't want to hide the children at home but at the same time we recognize that many of them do have issues around this so um, we want to kind of like problem solve around it for that individual child you see yeah in terms of you know um, so-called extending our help I don't I think we don't want to think of the person as suffering from a disease you see I think we need to we just want to recognize that they are sort of like wired differently it's not a illness that you know needs curing you see and ultimately, because of the way that their brain is, uh, they're, they're wired, sometimes the struggle, they can struggle a lot with certain things. And yet, these can also be like their superpowers, their strengths, you see. And because of that, actually, some employers prefer employees with ASD, you know. Like, you know, maybe these people gossip less, uh, they socialize less, so they actually can focus on their work more. Or because they pay attention to details, they are more focused with fewer mistakes in the road task. And because they are quite, you know, they once they get into a routine, they're quite happy staying in that routine. They may not be, they may not switch jobs so uh, readily like their neurotypical peers. Yeah, like you said earlier, you know, services for adults are still lacking, but it's also actually graduate, gra- gradually improving. So I think uh, parents of children who have uh, who are autistic, right? Um, I think we can actually look forward to a lot of social change, which in which is in their children's favor in the coming years. Okay, doctor. Yes, definitely learned a lot today about ASD. So um, please conclude with your closing comments, doctor. Okay, so I'm going to just, I'm going to end off by saying a few things, okay? I think the number one thing is uh, there's nothing to be ashamed of if your child has autism, okay? It is no one's fault. So please don't blame yourself. It's like I said earlier, it's not an illness to be cured or it's not a germ to be eradicated, you know. Um, and because we talked a little bit about uh, all these alternative treatments, I would say do not trust people who promise you that they can cure your child autism because if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. So you might end up not being able, in a sense, your child, your child doesn't really really actually get cured and you have spent a lot of money and potentially inflicted some harm. Now, um, and we also said earlier that autistic children have many strengths and their struggles can be their superpowers. So many famous people are actually probably at autism. You know, right now there's something called COP26, that global um, congress on the climate change, right? One of the best known climate activists, Greta Thunberg, Greta Thunberg, right, is this young woman who had this uh, teenager who actually led the Fridays for Future school strikes and like skipping school in order to strike for climate change. She's on, she is actually on the autism spectrum. She has she was diagnosed with what is termed Asperger's disease, uh, Asperger's syndrome rather. Okay, and you know that struggle with you know being so fixated on the climate. You know, oh my God, the climate is so depressing. She it did give her a lot difficulty and depression earlier on but when she actually found her voice it transformed into a superpower because now she's able to use uh, 
her voice. She's actually found her voice and she can actually talk at length about this. She knows probably much more than all the politicians and the leaders out there who, you know, more about than them about climate change. And she's able to say what the young people feel about uh, how climate change is going to affect their lives. So, you know, I think one needs to be, one needs to realize that, you know, it is not like, it's not, it's not all bad. Yeah. So because of this, I, do, I hope that uh, families do not run away from the diagnosis and denial. I think it's really important to allow yourself to grieve if you have, uh, if your child actually has received a diagnosis. But then um, after a period of grieving, you do need to move on to seek appropriate help for your child, you see. And please know that you are not going to journey alone. Uh, we need to find support. You need to find support for the journey, like your family, your friends, the medical team, the, the therapists who take care of your children. And there are many support groups out there in both in Singapore and overseas because it takes a village to raise a child. So don't believe that don't uh, believe that you're going to do it all alone. And then, of course, I have some last words for the people uh, whose loved ones may have autism. Like they might not be the immediate family, but they might be friends or stuff. Um, so like I said earlier, don't judge don't judge people's parenting. Don't go and criticize people's parenting. Um, try to learn a little more about the condition on your own. And also, you know, just give some encouraging words and offer your support. Even if you can't, if you, if you're not in a position to uh, help physically, I think at least people know that you have, that they have your mental, your moral support. And I think that's really important because um, at the individual level, also societal value uh, level, we want to support all these children, not just with autism the spectrum disorder, but also other uh, developmental difficulties. Yes, definitely, Doctor. So um, thank you so much for joining us today and taking the time. And uh, we learned a lot from your detailed explanation about ASD. Okay. Yes, Doctor, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm sure that this video will create some awareness and lead to a better understanding. Understanding, in turn, can evoke greater empathy and support. Greater empathy, in turn, will lead to increased acceptance. Let's do what we can in giving life to the endless dreams and possibilities for people with autism spectrum disorder. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it helped.